All right, everybody, uh, welcome to our February workshop. Um, we have an amazing program planned for you. Uh, but before we get into it, um, just a couple of introductions. Um, my name is Ian Tremisi. I'm going to be one of the workshop hosts. Um, hi, I'm Ovia, and I'm part of the outreach and research department at Simply Neuroscience. And um, I started working in the presynaptic project in Poland. And it's been a great experience so far. I'm so excited to be here, and I appreciate that you guys are here as well. Berlin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, unmute some of our other team members. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ria, and I'm the virtual challenge coordinator. Uh, that basically means I create um, fun challenges for you guys to do at the end of um, the presentation. Um, hi, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. Uh, my name is Shrey Mehta, and um, I will be the office hours coordinator. Hi, everyone. I um, don't know if anyone heard me the first time, but I'm Elisa, and I'm the other workshop um, challenge coordinator, and I'm excited to be working with you guys this month. So that I think is everyone here from the organizing team. That's the group of people who have worked really, really hard this past month um, to make this workshop possible. Um, if there's anyone who didn't get a chance to introduce themselves, please just send me a message um, because you definitely deserve to be recognized. Um, my name is Gerlene. I am the co-lead of the Presynaptic Project. So my job here is to actually help organize uh, this entire classroom. Um, many of the times, if you get a message on Google Classroom, that's myself. Um, I love this project. It's so amazing to be able to work with you guys and even be with people from all around the world right here from my own bedroom. So it really does mean a lot to me that you guys are here and that you're ready to learn. I'm also going to give my co-lead, Elizabeth, who is here, the chance to introduce herself. Um, Elizabeth? Hey, everyone. Um, it's nice to meet you. I'm Elizabeth, and as Gerlene said, I'm one of the co-leads as well. I just want to thank you all so much for joining us for the second workshop of this year, and if you're new, welcome. So this workshop is one of the series of six many different lessons, lesson plans that we have um, that introduce neuroscience and I'm so happy and excited that you're all here and we hope that you enjoy today's lesson about the science of sleep. And before we move on and actually get into the workshop content, because I know you guys are really excited, we also have our co-directors of Outreach and Research from Simply Neuroscience here who are just going to introduce themselves. So we have Sasha here. Hi everyone, I'm Sasha. Like Gerlene said, I'm the co-director of Outreach and Research here at Simply Neuroscience. I'm so excited to be here with all of you and you've already met our amazing team that has worked so hard to create this workshop for all of you. Um, like Gerlene said, I'm so proud that there are so many kids that um, are kind of here and willing to spend their morning, evening, afternoon, night um, with us to learn more about the brain and we really hope that you enjoy our workshop. Hi y'all, I'm Paige. I am another co-director of Outreach and Research at Simply Neuroscience. I have the pleasure of working with Sasha, Gerlene, and the rest of the team to create this workshop for you guys. I'm very excited to be here. Like Sasha said, it's great to see so much um, young interest in the brain and neuroscience. So we hope you guys enjoy this very interesting workshop. So moving on to the housekeeping rules. So um, it, it would be great if you guys keep your video and audio off during the workshop unless asked. And if you did not provide media consent, you guys could keep it off at all times. And for interaction, if you guys have any questions, feel free to use a chat box. And we appreciate if you guys could refrain from inappropriate messaging. You should also uh, be aware that these workshops are recorded. And um, if you guys want to review them in the future, they'll be posted on YouTube in a couple of days. And just remember that you don't have to attend every single workshop. Um, however, the attendance is taken for the prizes and certificates in June. 
And we expect you guys to attend at least two workshops. It'd be great to see you guys um, in the following months. So the other important thing for us to cover is the office hours. So in our presentation, we are going to be covering a lot of content that may be new to you. Um, it might be difficult, it might be complex. Um, and especially with the virtual challenge, there might be feedback that you want, there might be questions that you have. In case you do, um, Shrey is our office hours host. You can feel free uh, to join on February 20th at 1 p.m. Um, he's gonna be there to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and we are going to be posting the Zoom link for that after this workshop. Okay, so let's jump into the workshop. I know you guys are excited and I can't wait to start. So um, let's start off with a few pre-workshop questions. You should all have something called a neuro notebook so you guys could open that up. And you guys could use a chat if you guys have any problems opening that up. And once you guys have that open, um, we have a few pre-workshop questions in the first page and we would like you all to answer them. So this is kind of a warm-up activity to see if you guys know about the sleep and our brain. And let me know when you guys have that open. So just to like, um, for reference, the first question is basically, what do you guys think about sleep? And how do you think our brain is involved in sleep? So you guys could think about dreams and stuff like that. So if you guys would like, you guys could um, leave your answers in the chat. We would love to hear them. And once you guys are done, um, you could let me know in the chat as well. Okay, so we have, we have an answer from Dania. I think your brain is involved in sleep when you become tired and run out of fuel. Then your brain gets tired and falls asleep with you. That's an interesting thought. Thank you for that. Sleep helps refuel your energy. So that's why you think better when you get good sleep. That's, that's absolutely right. And even when you dream, your brain is imagining things. That's right. And Morgan, wow, it's great that you already know about REM and non-REM sleep. Thank you, Yusra. So Yusra says, I think that my brain is involved because it needs some rest and needs to shut down all the other systems. And I also think my brain helps me see dreams at night. That's true. It's a very good answer. Thank you, Shlok. That's, that's right as well. Our brain does sort out all the new information we learn throughout the day. Wow, it's great to see everyone engaged. And I think we can jump into the content of our workshop. So science and sleep. To answer the title question, yes. Though you ne never may have thought about it before, there's actually a lot of science that goes behind sleeping. And in order to talk about all of that, we have to first talk about our brains. So our brain plays a vital part in almost everything. And it is also an essential part to understanding how sleep works. So our brain is composed of various parts and some of these parts are actually involved in sleeping. So in the following slides, we will talk about these different parts and how they're involved. All right, so let's get into the first part. So the first part of the brain that's involved in our sleep is called the hypothalamus. Um, essentially, it's a pretty small structure um, inside the brain and it's composed of different groups of nerve cells. And uh, these groups are basically control centers. They regulate important things like sleep and your wake cycle. So think of this as almost like a headquarters, basically one of the headquarters that's important in regulating these functions. Yeah, so I can see a lot of um, answers in the chat. They're really, they're great. We're gonna cover most of these um, in our upcoming slides. Thank you guys for your answers. So moving on to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So like uh, Zayn mentioned before, it is a part of the hypothalamus. And these clusters of cells that it's composed with really help control our behavioral rhythm. And they do this by collecting information from the eye about light exposure. So in simpler terms, it helps light, it helps sense light to create a sleeping cycle. So the next part is called the brainstem. Uh, this one works basically in conjunction with the hypothalamus and it's made up of three pretty important parts. 
Uh, the first is the pons, then the medulla, and then the midbrain. And they all sort of come together to work um, to control the transitions between sleeping and wake. And it also helps uh, send signals to relax muscles and produce GABA, which is a chemical that helps reduce activity. So basically, when you're transitioning in the first and the last stages of going from sleep to wake or wake to sleep, whatever it may be, the brainstem plays a really crucial part in that. When we say that it helps send signals to relax muscle, it's basically helping your body getting ready to go to sleep. So, you know, slowing down any, you know, functions that you might have, relaxing your muscles, things that are important for you to uh, go to sleep, the brainstem is working hard to make sure that those things are happening. So moving on to the thalamus. So the thalamus actually helps relay information from the senses. And um, like we mentioned, sleep is actually commonly divided into four key stages. And the first three stages, which makes up the non-REM non sleep, um, the thalamus actually is quiet in order to allow you to sleep. So we can take this uh, using a real life example. Like when you wanna go to bed, you expect silence. And that's exactly what the thalamus does. It allows your environment to be in your, inside your brain to be quiet. And in the fourth stage, during our REM sleep, the thalamus actually becomes active, and that's when most of the action um, replays. Okay, so the next one is the pineal gland. Um, this gets signals from the SCN that we talked about earlier. And through this, it's basically able to produce melatonin, which is a really important hormone that helps, us put, helps put us to sleep when it becomes dark. And this production is pretty important in um, regulating the body's circadian rhythm. So if you've heard of melatonin before, um, it's probably the same thing that we're talking about because melatonin is something that you can also take if you have trouble sleeping. Um, they you know, sell it like over the counter and things like that. And you can basically, if you have trouble going to sleep, um, if you're a person who you, know, you lie in bed for hours trying to go to sleep, melatonin is something that you can take because it's a natural hormone and um, it helps you get sleepier and get a better night's sleep. So moving on to the midbrain. So as we mentioned previously, the midbrain is actually one of the three parts of the brainstem. And it's associated with a variety of functions, such as acting as an arousal system. And over here, we're referring to your energy level and your alertness. So it also plays a key role in temperature regulation and motor control during your sleep and wakefulness periods. And now for the amygdala. Um, this is a really small almond-shaped structure in the brain. Um, and it plays an important role in behavior and processing strong emotions. So during REM sleep, it becomes really active. And that's because during REM sleep, you do a lot of important things like dreaming. So this is activated because of any strong emotions that you might have in your dream. So if you're you know, having a nightmare, for example, the amygdala is usually pretty active because you're processing those types of emotions. Um, so that's the function of the amygdala. Right, so we have a brain function activity planned for you guys. So you guys can open up your neural notebooks and locate the brain function activity. Um, it's on the second page under introduction to the brain. Um, in this activity, you guys could try recalling the parts of the brain we learned and provide a one-liner or like brief a brief description of what these parts do and their functions. If you guys would like, you guys could um, Write them down in the chat. Yeah, we're looking forward to hear your answers. That is a good observation, Morgan. Yes, it is something that can be altered. It's impressive that you knew that, good job. So you guys could spend the next minute or two minutes um, writing down or typing. If you guys have it printed out, that's great. Um, the function of each brain part. And if you guys have any, any questions about them, uh, you could write them down in the chat. And if you're done, you guys could um, tell us as well. So we could move on.
right, so we'll give everyone maybe another minute and a half or so. And feel free to share your answers in the chat box if you'd like. So we have a question from Shlok. Can we access the slideshow? Um, I think the video is gonna be posted on the SN YouTube channel. So if you want access to it, you guys could check it out in a few days. The channel is called Simply Neuroscience. To kind of help our participants fill out the tables, do you guys mind going back to the slides? Yeah, for sure. sure. Uh, to answer your question, Suresh, yes, it is going to be recorded in the video. It's being recorded right now. Uh, just a thank you to everyone who sent me a private message about their Zoom name so I'm able to take attendance. Don't worry if you're unable to change it. Uh, as long as you let us know that you're here, we can keep you in the running for certificates at the end of the course. Okay, so we're going to give you guys about another minute so we could Yeah, sure. Dania, for your question, you guys could work on this anytime you'd like. If, you, um, if you're comfortable doing it after the workshop, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I think we could move on with our presentation. If everyone's done. Yeah, it's not like you, you know, have to get that done right now, completely filled out. You can always come back to it. Um, to just for time purposes, we'll move on to the next part of our uh, presentation, um, which is neurotransmitters. So what exactly are neurotransmitters? They're basically chemicals that are released by neurons, um, and they act as messengers since they travel from one neuron to transmit an impulse to another neuron. But, so to simplify that, Basically, your brain almost works in the form of like an electrical network. And these neurotransmitters are chemicals that are released by the neurons. And it sort of acts as like a mail delivery system, if you want to think about it that way to simplify it. Um, these basically send messenger, they, they're basically messengers and they send messages from one area to another. And that's basically how you um, are able to transmit really important neurological information. So to get into the specifics, the main transmitters that are involved in sleep are GABA, norepinephrine, orexin, acetylcholine, histamine, uh, and the last one is, sorry, I can't put the... Okay, so moving on to norepinephrine. So when we are stressed, norepinephrine is what helps us create that flight or fight response, as everyone's familiar with. And when we're awake, it actually keeps some parts of our brain active. And it also helps us wake up and increase our attention and focus. However, an excess of norepinephrine can cause decreased REM sleep, which is not that great. So moving on to orexin. 
So orexin is produced in the hypothalamus and it mainly controls our energy and wakefulness. Um, in addition, it is also thought to play an essential role in regulating systems that are both involved in our sleep and awakened states. And some of these are metabolism, our circadian rhythms, and our sleep depth. Uh, moving on to acetylcholine, um, this helps to activate muscles and it's involved in the sleep-wake cycle. And it's also really important in starting that last stage of REM sleep. And uh, acetylcholine levels are highest during REM sleep and in our awakened state. So if you think about it, acetylcholine, it helps to activate your muscles. Your muscles are more, most active in the awakened state. So that's a pretty uh, easy way for you to remember it if you're having a hard day. So moving on to histamine. So histamine is basically responsible for regulating our sleep-wake cycle. And it also impacts our biological clock, also known as our natural alarm system. And it's commonly known to be more active when we're awake instead of sleepy. And too little histamine can actually cause excessive sleepiness while too much can lead to insomnia. This implies that we need the perfect amount of histamine to have a perfect sleep function. And moving on to serotonin. So a serotonin is a very commonly known neurotransmitter for its impact on depression. But when related to sleep, like norepinephrine, it, aff it affects the sleep-wake cycle. And in addition, serotonin also helps maintain energy and also inhibits the REM cycle. Okay, now to sleep mechanism. So to give you a brief definition of this, these are basically the biological mechanisms that are involved in sleep. Um, biological mechanisms are essentially systems that contain different parts and they come together to create a certain effect. So in this case, um, that effect is sleep. And one of then two of the uh, mechanisms that are involved in sleep is circadian rhythms, like we talked about earlier. And the other one that's really important is sleep-wake homeostasis. So circadian rhythm. So I think this is the most essential term when it comes to the science of sleep. So they are the cycles that control and regulate our biological processes. They help control everything from the wakefulness to the release of hormones. So they're, they're in charge of our entire sleep system. So your body actually runs on a biological clock that controls most of our circadian rhythms. So this clock actually models a 24 hour day, which is why we see that these processes repeat roughly after 24 hours. So this is why we go to sleep every night. So in terms of sleep, circadian rhythms actually use different environmental cues such as light and temperature in order to control when you sleep. So by doing this, it actually causes you to be sleepy at certain times and not at other times. This is why you can naturally wake up without any alarms. So they also act as your body's natural alarm clocks. Right, and before we move on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to answer the question in the chat. Uh, Kanisha, that's a, apologize for the background noise, but uh, Kanisha, that's a really good question. Uh, we're actually about to, we're gonna get into that in our presentation. So hold on to that thought. So onto sleep-wake homeostasis. So um, this basically, the definition is sort of in the name. Um, it helps to regulate sleep. Uh, it reminds you that, you know, your body needs sleep and this gets stronger every hour that you aren't sleeping. So um, I'm sure anytime you've stayed up super late um, when you weren't supposed to, uh, you can feel yourself getting more tired and tired um, as, you know, the night goes on. That's sleep-wake homeostasis in action. And uh, many factors actually affect this. Uh, so, for example, if you get exposure to light, uh, your brain usually delays that sleep-wake cycle because it gets tricked into thinking that it's daytime, uh, which is exactly why doctors, scientists, and your parents tell you not to be on your phone, uh, iPad, laptops before you're going to sleep um, because your brain is now tricked into thinking that it's daytime and you're going to have a, a hard time going to bed at night, basically. And then some other factors that are pretty important um, when it comes to having an impact on sleep-wake homeostasis, uh, there's various medical conditions. Uh, your stress, uh, your diet, as well as the environment that you sleep in are all pretty important factors when it comes to uh, affecting sleep-wake homeostasis. Yeah, so now we're going to move on to perhaps the highlight of our workshop. So the stages of sleep. So when we talk about sleep, we divide it into two big sections, REM and non-REM sleep. So REM stands for rapid eye movement. And within these two categories, we further break them down into four stages. So the first three stages are part of non-REM sleep, while the fourth part is part of REM sleep. 
So every night we actually go through all these different stages several times. And each time that we complete all of these stages, the first three stages become shorter, allowing for longer periods of REM sleep, just like Morgan um, told us. And we'll go more in depth about each of these stages in the following slides. Right, so uh, stage one, um, this is a non-REM stage. This is basically the transition from going to the awakened state uh, to the sleep state. Um, this is you know, right at the beginning of when you go to sleep. Um, this is basically when your body sort of gets itself ready to go into sleep, uh, your heartbeat, breathing, um, brain waves, eye movements, muscles, everything sort of begins to slow down. And that's done so by a lot of the mechanisms that we talked to you guys about earlier. Um, and as a result, you're launched into a period that's very light sleep. So it's very easy to get woken up during this time period. Um, I'm sure as you've observed when you, you know, in your early stages of sleep. And then stage two, this is transitioning from that light sleep that we just talked about to entering into a much deeper sleep. Um, your body slows down even more, the temperature drops and your eye movements fully stop in this stage. Um, and that body temperature part is pretty key um, because if any of you guys actually sleep with like the fan on or um, if your parents have told you to sleep with a fan on or if you're having trouble going to sleep, uh, one of the reasons for that is actually because when your body temperature drops, um, that's one of the parts of stage two. So when you have a fan on, it's usually easier uh, to go to sleep or to activate that stage. And then thirdly, um, the brain waves also continue to slow down, uh, but there are still like prominent waves that usually represent outbursts of activity uh, within uh, the stage two. It's not like they completely go away. And then um, lastly, these brain waves are specifically called uh, sleep spindles. So moving on to stage three. So stage three is the final part of non-REM sleep. So in this part, we are in a deep sleep and our heart, heartbeat, brain waves, and breathing have slowed to the lowest level that they can get to in sleep. So our muscles are completely relaxed by now. So it's usually difficult to wake someone up in this stage. And last but not least, stage four, REM sleep. So this occurs after we've slept for about 90 minutes and this is finally when we're in REM sleep. So everything starts to closely resemble wakefulness um, as our breathing and brain waves speed up and our heart rate and blood pressure also increase. This is also where most of our dreams occur. So as a result of this, our bodies are actually temporarily paralyzed and this is to prevent acting out while we sleep. And towards the morning, we go through longer and more intense periods of REM sleep. Right, and then on the right here, we just have a graph for you guys that just depicts basically um, what the brainwave activity looks like um, while you're sleeping. Uh, yes, Morgan, these, uh, that occurs during the uh, REM cycle. Before we wake up, that's right. right. Yeah. Okay, crossword time. So um, in your neuro notebook, uh, there should be an activity that's labeled the vocabulary crossword activity. Um, basically, you can just fill in the crossword um, by, if you, you know, recall those concepts that we talked to you about earlier, um, there, there are also that you should have written down in your neuro notebook. Um, and another important thing to keep in mind is if an answer consists of two words, make sure that you do put a space uh, in between it. Otherwise, uh, you won't get the right answer. Um, and we are aware that the uh, crossword itself is actually an image. So if you want to just, if you have it printed out in the neural notebook, um, then you can just write it on there. Um, if you have it in a Google Doc, you can just type your answers uh, to that crossword. Or um, if you don't want to do either of those, then you can just, you know, maybe write it on a line sheet of paper. That works too. And if you guys have any questions while attempting the crossword, um, you guys could let us know. Natalie, that is actually a very good question. Um, I personally don't have the answer as to why people talk in their sleep, um, but if you do want to maybe Google it, um, or you know, that might be something that you could even ask at office hours or something like that, or maybe read a book on it, or watch a video. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, videos that are educational that would give you that answer. Um, yes, Dania, which slide would you like me to go back to?
So to answer um, Sarvish's question, so why do people suddenly wake up at REM sleep? So REM sleep is when our body is getting back to the wakefulness state. So we're actually, our heart rate, everything starts to speed up. So I think we're more um, aware and awake during REM sleep. So I think that's why a lot of us tend to wake up during that stage. Yeah, also dreams occur during um, the REM stage. Uh, Rami, that's a good question. Uh, how does sleep paralysis occur? Uh, basically, um, all those mechanisms that we talked to you about, uh, they basically um, put, they, they sort of activate that, um, all these mechanisms come together and they're responsible for doing that. Um, I don't know the exact process by which that occurs, um, but I do know that it's the mechanisms that cause that paralysis. So it's essentially when um, a person passes between stages of wakefulness and sleep. So between that, we tend to get into sleep paralysis. Yes, Nanya, of course. Thank you for that. Wow, you guys have great questions. Good to see everyone interacting. And if you guys have any questions regarding the crossword, feel free to drop it down and we'll be happy to help you guys. Sure, Danya. We, yeah, we can go one back, no problem. And no, you're not bothering us at all. I'm glad that you're actually asking questions and want to make sure that you got all the information right. Yep, no problem. Uh, yes, sorry, you can do that. So Morgan, uh, for your, it's a great question actually. So I think GABA receptors, um, they are present throughout your entire sleep cycle, but I think they're activated only during certain times. I will look into that and give you more details. All right, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to get some more answers for that crossword. You guys should remember to add a space if you think an answer has two words because um, that's when all the boxers are going to add up to the right answer. Okay, so just for time purposes, uh, we'll move on. But um, like we said, uh, you can still come back to this. Um, it's not like you have to completed within that uh, time that we would give you. Um, 
Donia, for your question, I think we could post the answers in the Google Classroom. And can music affect the way our brain works during sleep? That's a great question, actually. I'm pretty sure there's been research into that, but we can do some research into that because I'm not really sure. But I'm pretty sure it has a role during um, our sleep. Yeah, actually, wondering the answer to your question is yes. Um, if you've heard uh, in a lot of studies, people say to listen to like white, you know, sound, white sound or white noise. Sorry, uh, when you go to sleep, or maybe like classical music, um, whatever, whatever helps you sort of get relaxed uh, and going to sleep that way. Um, so there definitely has been research on it affecting the ways that you can sleep. Um, some different, I guess, genres of music uh, sort of help it. Some, you know, worsen that. So. It just really depends on whatever you listen to. Yeah. Okay, so now for a Kahoot. Um, whenever I uh, do open up that link, uh, just make sure that you guys uh, use your first name and that last initial as your Kahoot name. Uh, that way we know who you are. Um, uh, like refrain from using any inappropriate names, please. Um, we know you guys won't do that, but just as a uh, cautionary reminder. Um, so I will Okay, so we have a lot of people joining in. Do we have everyone? Is there, are there people yet to join? If anyone yeah, is, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think there's still a few people that. If you are waiting to join um, and it's taking you some time, just drop a message in the chat and so we will not start without you. Yeah. Uh, Ayushi, that's fine. Um, we'll just know that the auto-generated name is yours. Yep, it is a unlocked Kahoot. So in case somebody has technical difficulties, you guys could join back in and um, you guys could hop in on any question we have on the screen. Does anyone else need some time to join? I think we 
we have everyone? Okay. In that case, let's begin. In which stage of sleep does REM occur? Wow, we're getting answers really fast. That's great. 18. 19, wow. Wow, okay, 14 of you got it right. That's great. Okay, what mechanisms are involved? Answers should be quick, that's exciting. Wow, 12, 12 of you got it right. Nice job, nobody put digestion. <laughs> and Samaya's in the lead. What is the function of the neurotransmitter orexin? We have about 12 answers, 16. Nineteen. That, that was a close one actually. Yes, yeah, so remember that um, erection is basically responsible for controlling your energy and your weakness. It does play other roles, um, but this is the main one. Which part of the brain plays a role in behavior and processing strong emotions? Oh, wow, this is coming in really fast. Great to see. Nice job, guys. A lot of you guys got this one right. We have Sammy in the lead. What hormone controls sleep in our brains? Yeah, good job, guys. So remember melatonin? Uh, this is basically uh, that hormone that we talked about um, that basically makes you sleepy. Um, this is that same hormone that we said that you could essentially take if you have trouble sleeping as well. Do you guys remember the passcode for today's Zoom meeting was actually melatonin. So now you guys know what that is. Yeah, Sammy's in the lead. What is the name of the function that reminds us of our need for sleep? We have answers coming in and everyone's catching up. That's great. Where's the last question, guys, is for the win. Where is the rexin produced? And in third place, we have Usera. Second place, we have Lynn. In the first place, we have Sammy. Nice job, everyone. Okay. Great job, everyone. 
Okay, so uh, now for the February design challenge, um, we're going to hand to uh, one of our challenge coordinators um, and they'll talk to you. Um, so hi everyone, I hope you learned a lot about um, science and sleep. So the virtual challenge is basically a way for you guys to um, show off the knowledge that you learned throughout the workshop. Um, so for this month, Eliza and I um, have planned a scavenger hunt. So we will basically provide the function of the brain part that is involved in sleep, and you will have to find the picture of the part. Um, the last question is a creative response. I'm really looking forward to all of your answers. And if you have any questions regarding the challenge, feel free to reach out. Um, so good luck to everyone, and I'm really excited to see what you say. Okay, so if, um, if anyone has yeah. any questions, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you could, you could go on. Yeah, so um, if anyone has any questions um, that they, you know, didn't get to ask in the chat or they were saving for later, um, now is the perfect time for you guys to ask any um, questions that you need. If you guys have any couple questions about this month's challenge as well, we have our monthly challenge coordinators who can uh, help you guys with that. And to go ahead. Yeah, and to answer Kanisha's question, so we've actually assigned um, the third page, create a plan for homework, so you guys could um, plan your own sleep schedule for yourself. And the fourth page, we're um, getting to that, you guys could fill in your reflection um, through the post-workshop questions. If you guys would like, you could um, drop it down in the chat or type it up in your neural notebook. Just a reminder that you don't have to do it. If you're like super slammed with schoolwork or you don't want to keep working on the project, you don't have to and you don't have to turn this work into us because we won't be marking it. The only kind of things that you do turn into us in this class is the monthly challenges, which are again optional. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, it could be about the workshop. It could be about the class. It could be anything for our amazing presenters who did such a great job today. Okay, well, if there aren't any questions, then you guys uh, are free to go. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? Yeah. Okay, yes. So we hope that everyone who came here today really enjoyed the workshop. Um, we had so much fun working on this and just a super big shout out to the entire team who worked so hard to put this together for you guys. Um, just answering a couple questions in the chat. We do workshops once a month. So the next one will be in March. Uh, with a new topic, but there's going to be an office hours next weekend. Um, the, the dates are going to be posted on Google Classroom. If you look on the calendar, we have um, the office hours, which is if any question comes to mind or you're working on the project and you have um, a point of clarification that you might need, you can just drop in for a quick half hour, ask any questions, chat, network, whatever it is. And uh, that's kind of the only other event we have this month. Aside from that, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, we will be posting a feedback form um, on Google Classroom very shortly. On this feedback form, we just wanna know if you guys enjoy the workshops, if you think the content is too easy, too hard. And there's also an option for your parents to sign up for kind of like a monthly update of what we did in the course. So you guys definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, there's another question, is the project posted? Yes, it was posted at 11.30, so you guys can read through the instructions. Yes, the PowerPoint will also be posted after this workshop. And the recording will be up shortly as well. Thank you guys. Feel free to um, head out and enjoy the rest of your day, night, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you guys. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys for showing up. <laughs>